The Health Fix Podcast teaches you how to take charge of your health naturally by giving you the information you need to elevate your health. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. Today, I'm going to be talking with Nora Pope and Dr. Jessica Liu. Both of the gals are naturopathic doctors. Nora just happens to be retired. Jessica has 15 years of experience working with women's health and fertility. And the two have teamed up to help folks understand their periods better by using cycle charting versus relying on apps that might not be accurate. So today, we're going to be talking about how understanding your period, connecting with your body better, and looking at the overall health of your period as an indicator of your health. So let's jump into the podcast. Hey there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Today, I have two guests with me. This is a big deal. I have Nora Pope and I have Dr. Jessica Liu. They are specialists in fertility, and we are going to be talking about cycle charting. We're going to be talking about fertility awareness and literacy in terms of fertility, and we're going to be talking about infertility treatments. And so Nora (laughs) and Dr. Liu or Jessica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here with you. Thanks for having us, Dr. Janine. I love your workout videos, by the way, on Instagram. They're so much They're fun. very motivating. You know, you do 20 push-ups and then you hold it. Just hanging, just hanging. Like you're so <laughs> chill and you're really in shape. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. Those were so much fun to do. The people that were watching us must have thought I was the weirdest person in the world. They're like, what is she doing? Making her husband videotape her while she's at the beach. Can't you just enjoy the beach? So, you know, I try to find little awesome. places to get in and work out whenever I can because it, it's just part of my life. But it's just so much fun fun to play around. It's kind of like being a kid all over again. It's like yeah, my yeah. excuse to be a kid. I call it a workout. Yeah. yeah. No excuse needed. Awesome. And anything with the beach is awesome. <laughs> oh, I know it's just so, <laughs> so grounding. It's so wonderful. I wish that I lived closer to the ocean. I, I live close to the sound here in Tacoma, but it's, it's not the same. It's just not right. The same. Right. So we're going to be talking today about all, all things kind of fertility. And, and for those of you who are listening, if you do not suffer with infertility, that's okay. Because I think fertility in general is a, a big umbrella topic for us to really kind of dive into what's up with our period, what's up with our hormones, and, and how do we get these things right? Because I have so many people coming into my office and saying, doc, my hormones are off. And, and I'm like, okay, how do you know? They're like, I just know. It just feels right. It just feels wrong. Everything feels wrong. Help me feel better. Help me fix these things. And so you two have created some courses. And of course, there's a big one online that you just released not too long ago and and, and for us practitioners. But in terms of the lay person, cycle charting, a lot of people might be thinking, okay, is this another app? Like, what what is this? What do, what do we do with cycle charting? So can you two dive in and tell me a little bit about cycle charting and how this might benefit someone, anyone, you know, not even necessarily having uh, to do with infertility? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to just put myself back in the, you know, naturopathic doctor chair. I would, I had a practice in Toronto for 20 years and this would be my first visit. And I would, with a new patient and I would say, tell me about your cycle. So let's start with cycle day one, your bleed. Tell me about your bleed. How many days is it? So just to insert some education here, we call this a a healthy biomarker if you have five days of bleed. Mm -hmm. So that's now you're beginning to cycle chart. So you can use a Excel spreadsheet and you can start putting, you know, five red stickers on days one through five of your cycle. And then what's after that, what's common is that some, many women will experience dry days and that's because your hormones are low. And on those dry days, you know, roughly cycle day six, seven, and eight, that's a really good time to get a pap smear Mm -hmm. because hormones are quiescent. It's a really good time of the month to do a breast self-exam, a monthly breast self-exam because hormones are low and you can get to know your breasts in the shower with, you know, you can shampoo over them or massage them with lotion and get to know them. And it's also a very good time of the month to do a baseline ultrasound, both trans, transvaginal and abdominal. And because the hormones are low and you're getting a good snapshot of what sort of, you know, sort of, you know, low um, hormones on hormonally sensitive tissues. So that's a good time to do that. Then all of a sudden, the follicle in your ovary is going to start to grow and you're going to get rising blood estrogen levels because the follicle is growing. And in turn, with that rising blood estrogen, 
they're going to turn on estrogen receptors in your cervix and produce what we call fertile mucus. Ooh, mucus. We call it white flow in our course. Um, we want to make it media friendly. And that's one of our you know, visions and call to actions. It's going to be on a t-shirt. White flow oh. makes babies. Woo-hoo. So, <laughs> and actually, no, we're going to make it into a non-fungible, what's it called? Those NFT non-fungible, it's like every, Saturday Night Live did a skit about it. You know, we're going to make this cyberspace video image about it and, and a non-fungible token. That's what it's called. NFT. There we go. So that's, that's our first one. But um, so then, so those are days of fertility and why I keep mentioning fertility is that this system was developed by doctors and nurses for the public who want to naturally space out their pregnancies without drugs and, you know, artificial hormones. And so that's a day of fertility. So if you want to make a baby, you have sexual intercourse on that day. If you don't want to make a baby, you postpone sex to when the days of infertility kick in again. So you have that white flow. It's either clear, slippery, or lubricative or, um, or stretchy. And that book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, talk about egg whites, but you don't need egg whites. You need that slippery sensation when you're wiping. And then boom, you're going to have that middle of the month pain. Bing! It's like a little twinge. And that's the follicle rupturing and, re- and releasing an ova. And the fingers of the fallopian tubes or the um, will grab that ova. And that's where conception will take place is inside the fallopian tube. And then if you don't get pregnant, you're going to have um, rising progesterone and you're going to have dry days. And those are days of infertility and you won't get pregnant on that day if you have intercourse. So days of fertility are the white flow. Days of infertility are roughly the the dry days. And then your cycle begins again. So just by listening to someone on their first appointment, ah, this woman has five days of, of red flow. Good sign. Ah, this woman has five days of white flow. Good sign. Ah, the time when her, her white flow ended until her next period was, you know, 10 to 13, 14 days. Excellent. She, that's a healthy cycle. But as we can, as your listeners can imagine, a lot of women don't have that kind of cycle. Mm-hmm. And a lot of doctors aren't hearing that from their patients. So that's the beauty of cycle charting is that you're getting body literacy and you're getting a hormonal snapshot before any blood test is taken. That's why I love it. Why do you love it, Dr. Jessica? <laughs> well, I'm going to say what I don't love about the apps. And there was, you know, um, Dr. Marguerite Duane. Um, she's a wonderful uh, cycle charting expert in in the States. She does a lot of teaching. She teaches medical doctors. And at, she, at, she did, at, Georgetown, yeah, at Georgetown University, she offers an elective for med students. It's the mm-hmm. only one, only program of its kind that I know of in the United States at Georgetown University. Because most of my patients will come and say, "Well, I, I'm tracking on an app, and then I'm I'm looking at their site, their their app tracking, and I realize that their body awareness or their observations don't always line up with what the app is telling us. Also, because the app is based on algorithm, it's based on data from you know thousands of collections of of, of people's data, which is fine." But if your cycle is irregular from month to month, with which can be a normal thing for most women, only 13% of women ovulate perfectly on day 14, and it's not a have to. But if your app is only giving you data from last month and something happens this month, like you didn't you cross some time zones or you didn't sleep well or you had a huge stress at work, then maybe ovulation would come a little bit too early this month or too late, which is fine. But if you're not tracking your own body's biomarkers and you're just basing it on the app, you're going to miss it. And this is where we can have missed opportunities uh, for conception if if that's your intention or accidental pregnancies. And I've seen this in my practice. I've been in practice for over 15 years now, and that's happened more than I'd like to see. I want it to be intentional and I want women to have a healthy connection to their body and to feel empowered in this process because let's face it now in Canada, at least infertility is affecting one out of every five or six couples. And the biggest thing that I'm hearing from everybody that I'm seeing is that it is the most stressful thing that they have had to go through. It's traumatic and it's, it's a lot of poking and prodding. And for them to be able to say, at least I know what's happening to my body every single day, that's empowering for a woman. Mm-hmm. Right. And also now I'm, so now I'm going to jump in here and I, I maybe I need anger management. So I'm, I'm going to say this as sweetly as possible, but uh, 
<laughs> no, I think, I think um, you know, it's 2021 and medicine is still not practiced properly and it's still not, you know, pro fertility awareness and body literacy awareness. I mean, yeah. you know, so like I mentioned earlier, everyone knows about seminal fluid and sperm counts and sperm motility, and everyone knows about egg quality and ovulation and, and so forth. And that's a very uh, disjointed view of fertility. And what we teach in our course is what unites fertility is, you know, healthy sperm from a healthy man who's not, you know, who's not dying and a healthy woman has healthy ovaries who's not dying. I hate to be so sardonic, but what unites them is the woman's white flow. And um, men create white flow called seminal fluid and women create white flow, which is uh, cervical fluid. And because it's viewed as icky, it doesn't get the press it deserves. It's very important. And if you're going to have sex, you need the woman's white flow to help transport the man's white flow to the fallopian tube. And it, it, you just won't get pregnant if there's no white flow in the woman, because normally the vagina is acidic and will kill off sperm in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But when you produce white flow during that growing follicle with rising blood estrogen, that white flow has, like seminal fluid, is full of fructose, full of potassium, full of zinc, you know, the fertility mineral, mm -hmm. and it's going to help carry that sperm to the ova. And then also, um, when the woman has rising blood estrogen, if you look on an ultra, if you did a daily ultrasound of a woman's uterus, the, the actual uterus is propelling upward the mm -hmm. seminal fluid and the cervical fluid. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful, wonderful physiology. And then boom, right after conception or not, you know, but when progesterone kicks in, the uterus is very calm very, very calm. So implantation can occur. Mm -hmm. So, so, and white flow is never discussed in fertility clinics. It drives me crazy, yeah. but happily there's a growing community of medical doctors and naturopathic doctors and pharmacists and, and TCM doctors who are, are taking an interest in white flow. And I'm delighted. And we're, we're, you know, Jessica and I are doing our small contribution and we've educated about 250 people already in North America and growing. So we're just baby steps. We want to make it 25,000 people before we die. <laughs> yeah. You know, our, I guess our planetary goal also would be that young women, you know, in their adolescence kind of have that body awareness, right? So that there's no ick factor that it's celebrated, you know, and then we can be catching things ahead of time instead of putting our girls on birth control pill when they're too early you know, and that, that sort of can suppress some things and, you know, make certain things symptomatically managed, but does that really treat the root problem? No. And there are, there is a cost to doing exogenous synthetic hormones, uh, for instance, bone density loss, right. Later in life. So, so th these are the things that we care about and it's just such an elegant system and it's accessible. So if you, you know, you were backpacking in Nepal and there was no cell service, what are you going to do? You can still track your cycles every day just by wiping. Like you have to pee every day. So that's an opportunity several times a day to, to, to get that data. Right. And if you know what you're looking for, the accuracy level is amazing. Right. So studies have shown who looked at this method of charting, just three months of charting can increase your chances of natural conception by up to 90%. Wow. So for us, that, that's a game changer, right? For a lot of couples, just, just then, having that awareness. And then also um, the beauty of cycle charting is that not only is it your roadmap to learn about your days of fertility and days of infertility, but it's a roadmap for, for the physician to time blood tests and time ultrasounds. You know, I was speaking to, um, you know, a client this morning and this woman started her white flow very late in her cycle, like day 16. She had a very long cycle. And normally women are told to get an ultrasound series beginning on cycle day now, nine. So that's, that's, a, that's a week too soon. So mm -hmm. in our course, we teach clinicians to tell their patients, start doing your ultrasound series on your white flow days, because that's the follicles doing something. It's growing. Mm -hmm. And you want to monitor, monitor, monitor to see if it's growing. And eventually does it rupture? Mm -hmm. And that's those, you, so the white flow guides you. And then when the white flow ends, then I'm done. I take it away, <laughs> Dr. Lou, about post-peak. <laughs> so, you know, again, like I said, that not everybody is going to ovulate on that same day. You don't need a 28-day cycle to, to conceive well. You need these biomarkers, right? So what we want to see is a stable post-peak window, because at that point, it's 
that corpus luteum, that follicle that's ruptured the egg now becomes your progesterone pumping organ. And it should be stable because it's tucked away in the ovary. It's away from all the influence of all your brain hormones, right? So that two weeks, roughly 10 to 14 days, we like to see 12 to 14 days of a post-peak phase before your next period shows up, right? And so to test progesterone then to say to a woman, oh, just go and get it on done on day 21. Well, if she has an irregular cycle or if she has a 42 day cycle, that's not really going to work. Right. So the most accurate way to test progesterone, which is your hormone to protect your pregnancy is seven days after peak mucus day. Mm. And that is something we teach our patients and our docs. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that, that doctors is such an easy thing to get accurate data and it's not being utilized effectively. Yeah. No, I think that's important because I've been always taught day 19 to 26 go for the progesterone. That That's kind of the standard in the, in the functional med and, and whatnot um, mm -hmm. arena too. And I think this is the thing. So no, 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 no. That's actually, that's, that's can be, can be harmful for some women if their cycle isn't exactly 28 days. So we teach our, our docs to prescribe progesterone peak plus three to peak plus 12. And I'm very emphatic about this because you want to follow and sync up with the woman's individual woman's cycle. So if a woman ovulates or peaks on day 10 of her cycle, then you want to start progesterone on cycle day 13 and only do it for 10 days. Mm -hmm. If she has a longer cycle and she peaks on day 20, then you want to introduce progesterone on cycle day 23. Right. It's very, and, yeah. yeah. And then, and, and, you know, as far as testing that range day cycle day, 19 to 26, a lot can happen in those days. So you have a woman who has a luteal phase deficiency, meaning her, her progesterone kind of drops off by the time you get to day 25, there could be nothing there. And then you're sort of missing the picture. Right. Yeah. Um, and so cycle charting, then you don't, if there wasn't the ability to test for whatever reason, you can still get good, mm -hmm. accurate data from the charting observations mm -hmm. alone. Blood tests helps the practitioner in terms of dosage, dosages, yeah. prescribing. Yeah. Do I want to yeah. use herbs or is it just so much in the toilet that we've got to get in there or else there's a risk of miscarriage in pregnancy, right? Um, but for the patient, it's, you know, not to get too stressed about the testing. It's the, the observation that'll make them feel better. And then to Nora's point, this idea of non-fertile days being of equal value to the woman as her fertile days takes the pressure off. They yeah. can have spice and connection and intimacy. <laughs> and, and, and then you can decide, is this the month we're going to postpone pregnancy or do we want to turn it on again and, and focus on the fertility days, right? Wow. But the fertility days are fewer in the month than your non-fertility days. So you want to be able to celebrate both, mm -hmm. right? You need to understand your dry days in order to appreciate your non-dry days, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge thing to note. Looking at, I mean, let's, let's put it first. A lot of us are not connected with our bodies. We just mm -hmm. aren't. And, and we're not taught to connect with the bodies. I think this is something I, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago on my own talking about what we didn't learn in kindergarten and, <laughs> and, you know, stress management being the main focus of that topic that I was talking about. But this is another thing is body awareness and really as females being able to understand our cycles. And, and sadly, a lot of the books that we grew up with in biology, you look at who wrote it, men and no, no disrespect to men. It's just that you don't have the same parts in terms of what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a different, it's a different factor. And it's like, okay, scientifically, but I do have a lot of patients that come in and are hung up. They're like, I'm not ovulating on day 14. And it's yeah. a big deal. And you're like, uh, um, so what? That makes um, me sad. That makes me really yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah, no. So, but, you know, we, we, um, Anyway, anyway, if you, I can I can assure your listeners, if you learn your biomarkers, you're going to feel very grounded and you're going to feel very at peace that you have a healthy cycle. If you have five days of bleed, mm -hmm. five days of white flow and a post peak phase of anywhere from 10 to 15 days. And you don't want too much variability in that from month to month. So it can be 12 days, one month, 11, the next 13, the next, you know, and that is a healthy cycle. That mm -hmm. is a healthy cycle because what's. You know, I've mentioned three stable numbers, red flow, five, white flow, five, post peak phase, five days times two or three there, the rule of five. But before you're, before you ovulate, um, that can be a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be much longer in some women and much shorter than other women. So, but if you have those anchors of five days of red flow, five days of white flow and a stable post peak phase, you're healthy. 
And what I mean by healthy is that you're ovulating and that ovulation process is helping you, you know, stabilize and support your bone health, your brain health, your heart health. It's not just about making babies. Ovulation mm -hmm. is a vital sign. Yeah. And uh, like respiration and blood pressure and heart rate, um, you need that circulation and heartbeat to circulate those hormones throughout your body and feed your body from head to toe. Yeah. So fifth vital sign, can't say it enough. I have a lot of women who are very reliant on their urine strips. And I, you know, we kind of talk about that, like a fair weather friend, like sometimes <laughs> they come too early to dinner or they don't want to leave. And it's not, it's not entirely precise, right? So in terms of, you know, what if you don't have access to them? They're expensive. They're not that reliable. They're pulsatile. If you have PCOS or endometriosis, that LH surge could be all off the chart. It may not be reliable for you. So again, the most reliable biomarker that you can get, you don't even have to look at it or play with it. Nobody's asking you to dig around in there. It's just, you're going pee and you're wiping from front to back and you're noticing, hmm, is there a little more slip to it than the day before? Is there a change in my body? And you're just sort of making these daily wiping observations and you're just charting once a day at the end of the day. You know, even one, you could be dry, dry, dry. And then whoop, at eight o'clock, it's like a little more slippery down there. That's a fertile sign, mm -hmm. you know, and it, there's a crescendo effect to peak day, which is the peak estrogen day. So it's the day of your month with the highest estrogen correlating with the most slippery sensation that you, you can imagine. And then the following day, estrogen plummets, that's what triggers LH. So you should ovulate around, you know, 24 to 36 hours later, but again, it's variable for different women, Right. But peak estrogen day is such a reliable predictor of imminent ovulation um, to occur. And we want to see that happening with reliability every month. That's awesome. That's awesome. So folks who are listening might be thinking on this level going, okay, what if my period is like three days and it's super mm -hmm. light yeah. and I think I'm dry the whole time? What do I do about this? And if I start making changes, how long should I expect before I see changes? Because so that's kind of the big, I, I hear both of those. Like my, my period is really light or I have the opposite of my period lasts 10 days, kind of right. super heavy. So right. what kind of things might you recommend to folks to start investigating on their own and then also getting help, things of that nature? What would be your, your recommendations for folks thinking right now? Well, that sounds nice, but my period, it doesn't fit any of this. <laughs> so I'll start, I'll start yeah, with the light ahead. period. So if, you're, if your period is light, meaning it's, you know, one, two or three days, that is a general indication that you have low hormones. Mm -hmm. So you're low in estrogen and you're low in progesterone because those two hormones work in concert to build up the lining of the uterus. Mm -hmm. And so the five days of red flow indicates that you had a healthy and ideal level of both hormones from the previous cycle. So that's just one indication. So why are your hormones low? So in the, the very, very basics, you know, in terms of diet, what are, what are pro-hormone nutrients? Like I can think of vitamin D at the top of my head. And of course, zinc I mentioned earlier. And, and then perhaps too much exercise. So if you're exercising a lot and you're losing weight, you could be low in hormones as well. Mm -hmm. So those are just some of the, the lifestyle, lifestyle factors. If you're trying to start a family, then absolutely, um, the, those wiping observations you're making, dry days, that's very valuable information. Because if you're dry, 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 that indicates that the follicle isn't growing and maybe you're not ovulating and rupturing that follicle. Mm -hmm. So you need that information and you can get an ultrasound series, but I bet you dollars to donuts, if you have a very dry cycle, you're not rupturing that little follicle. Mm -hmm. um, that's been countless observations. Yeah, you're just not getting that critical mass of yeah. estrogen to trigger that rupture, right? And so for us, the treatment, you know, it, it can take some time depending on what the reason is. Like some women need uh, a massive dose of say vitamin B6 or, or, you know, and that might work over a couple of cycles or it might take four or five cycles. You know, if you're really chronically stressed, you're working out like crazy, you're not sleeping, that's going to impact your hormones too. So some of those things require some time to make those lifestyle changes, right? There are herbs that we can use to support um, pre and post peak, but I don't want to get into too much of that because everybody's different, right? But I would say like, make sure you're getting good fats and proteins Make sure you're getting in some good phytoestrogenic things like good flax seeds or chia seeds, yams, chickpeas. 
you know, make sure you're getting some good leafy greens in your diet to make sure that your liver is detoxifying things properly. Diet is key, right? And so again, we want to be asking our clients to make those changes right up front because, you know, we, we want to see a little bit of change month to month. Doesn't mean you're going to get from no, no cervical fluid at all to goopy, goopy three inch long strings with one cycle, but you might see a change in your mood, energy, sleep might improve. And we know for a fact that if your nighttime cortisol is lower, progesterone is going to be better, right? Your hormones will be better if your stress hormones are coming down. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so within about three to four cycles, we should be seeing good changes in the biomarkers, less menstrual pain, less clotting, less premenstrual brown bleeding. We don't want to see too much tail end brown bleeding as well, because that could indicate some inflammation or irritation in the lining of the endometrial um, tissue, right? It's like necrotic tissue just kind of sitting there. It's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So we do want to see changes in your menstruum or the quality of your menstrual blood cycle to cycle, or, you know, every three months, we should be seeing a bit of a change, bright red blood, no brown discharge for days and days before your period comes on. It should just kind of come on. And I have patients who come in and they're like, Jessica, I'm celebrating because I was surprised by my period. There was no cramping, no moodiness, no headaches. And it just came on bright and beautiful and we're celebrating, right? <laughs> Red flow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it deserves a high five in some cases. I mean, that's a lot of, it's a lot of diligence to get there some days. Um, for for sure. There's so many, so many things in, involved. So now I want to transition to talking about progesterone because it personally saved my life. Um, I, <laughs> I was, you know, Nora, you had mentioned progesterone being that calm hormone, relaxing hormone. I couldn't sleep to save my life for probably most of my, while well, I was at Bastyr, for example. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of kept going for, for quite some time. And, and, you know, I have the education. I know, I knew that I should probably do something about it, but I was like, <gasps> My mom died of breast cancer. My aunt died of breast cancer. Mm. I, just, I don't want hormones in my body. I don't want to mm. do this. And and meanwhile, I'm trying every supplement under the sun, every regimen under the sun. Can't get myself to sleep, and my my progesterone consistently was in the tank. Mm. And no wonder I couldn't get pregnant be, or keep a pregnancy because, well, you have no progesterone, Janine. What are you doing? Right. Right. So I would love for other folks to hear a little bit about how progesterone plays in to mm -hmm. your cycle and why we are actually really talking a lot more about it now and, and how you guys talk about it within. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy that it's entered the dialogue. So I'd like to, I was watching CNN about, gosh, well over 10 years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And it was the Larry King Live. And the biggest screaming match I ever saw on CNN oh, wow. was not about Donald Trump, was not about <laughs> Bill Clinton. It wasn't about Hillary Clinton. It wasn't about, you know, Obama. It was about progesterone. Oh, and I goodness. swear to God, I swear to God, <laughs> Dr. Susan, no, no, I shouldn't say that, but a doctor from California and Suzanne Summers was on CNN talking about progesterone. And Everything Suzanne Summers said was correct, but because she's Suzanne Summers, no one was taking her seriously. And so you had a you had the nice doctor saying, you know, actually progesterone does help women, and you had the opposite doctor saying, no, progesterone hurts women. So not, question number one: What kind of progesterone are you giving women? So there's yes. in the in the birth control pill, it's I, I wouldn't even call that a hormone. So I I try to clarify. I would call that a hormone receptor agonist. That's what the pill is. So it's a compound that's artificial that will go towards a progesterone or estrogen receptor and bind to it and create an artificially medium level of hormones. So medium in the sense that a medium amount of progesterone before ovulation will antagonize ovulation, so it won't happen. And a medium amount of estrogen after ovulation will antagonize progesterone and not, you know, build a stable uterus and a stable lining to accept a conceptus. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what artificial hormones do. And yes, they're carcinogenic. So, you know, the pill is on the list of carcinogens according to the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some artificial receptor agonists called fake progesterone are harmful mm -hmm. and can are can cancer causing. But the progesterone we're advocating is called bioidentical and that's confusing. So I'm going to call it human identical. Yeah. It's a human identical hormone it can be synthesized in a test tube 
doesn't have to come from plants, but it's synthesized. And, uh, you know, a good form is called oral micronized progesterone, and that can come in the lab. Or you can get it compounded in a pharmacy from vegetables like potatoes or soy or, and, and so that's, um, that's a wonderful delivery option. You have the oral capsules, oral progesterone, micronized, very good absorption, and you can insert that capsule in your vagina, or you can have a good compounded product in an oil base because like dissolves like, hormones being oily um, will dissolve in, in a nice you know capsule or suppository base. Those are your options. They also have trochees that you can put in your mouth. So there's all kinds of delivery methods. And you want to mimic and be in harmony with the woman's cycle. That's why we say peak plus three to peak plus 12 as mm-hmm. a public service announcement. <laughs> and, and progesterone can get antagonized, um, but progesterone and estrogen are friends. They work together yeah. post-peak to build the lining of the uterus. So you mm-hmm. want a good ratio of the two of them. And when I was in school, when I was at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, estrogen dominance was a real problem in the 90s. Um, but now I'm thinking, I'm seeing estrogen deficiency, yeah, you know, so for sure. So. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, now I think the the world is sort of, you know, open to looking at this more because we need a different option for say women with postpartum depression. We need a different option for women who are losing their babies um, in their first trimester. And the problem is, is that we're just, even fertility clinics aren't testing progesterone past that conception day, right. Or pass the, the positive HCG test. Mm -hmm. So if you have a woman who's had a history of preterm delivery or preemie babies or cervical incompetence, you should be checking. So, you know, you're, you're treating with progesterone. So a lot of patients who are going through IVF, they're going to get progesterone anyways, but then it stops cold Turkey after 12 weeks and there's no follow through. So who's to say that her own levels aren't climbing and they, and progesterone is safe for the baby. It's highly concentrated in the placental artery and veins. Um, and it's really important to sustain the pregnancy and prevent things like premature rem- membrane rupture and preterm delivery can save a pregnancy. I had a mom deliver, um, f- you know, there was nothing wrong with the baby, nothing wrong with her cervix. She just delivered at 22 weeks. Wow. And at 22 weeks, the, the lungs aren't even bare minimum developed for survival, right? So the baby doesn't, didn't really have a, have a good shot, but she'd been on progesterone that whole time. And so whether they dated their, her pregnancy incorrectly, but for whatever reason, that baby hung on and he's doing great. And the doctors looked at her case and said, they thought that having the extra progesterone past the first trimester really, really helped save this pregnancy. Yeah. So, so certainly more research needs to be done and we need more um, good research on bioidentical progesterone because it's, you know, I tell my patients, it's like comparing apples to zebras. It's not the same as the synthetic stuff that all the, all those negative things that we've seen, there's, there's no association with natural progesterone um, in terms of cardiovascular risk. Um, and it's actually shown to be protective against things like breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So yeah. We need more, yeah. more people talking about it. Absolutely. And I think one of the big things that a lot of people are confused about right now is the difference between what's on what you can buy on the market. So a cream over the counter, like some of the brands like Protocol for Life or Emerita's brand is what we have in the US. I'm not familiar with all of the brands that you can get over, over the counter in, in Canada. I've seen some of them um, from patients that have showed me different things. But it, a lot of people are asking me in my practice, and I'd love to hear from, from you two, what seems to be the the progesterone of choice? Is it the oral micronized that you get from a compounding pharmacy or do you sometimes use some of the creams or does it depend? And, and what what would be the situation in which you would choose to use a cream or a trochee versus a, a capsule? I think it depends on what the situation is and what their levels are, right? Remembering that when you're testing blood, you're only testing really what your own body is producing. Once you add in therapy, if you're doing it transvaginal or transdermal through the skin, unless you're doing it orally, you're, it's not going to show up as a reading on your bloodstream, right? Because right? that's only really showing what's circulating through your blood and tissue direct to tissue is you're not going to catch it in blood, right? So you're looking to see if your own patient's endogenous hormones are holding steady 
with your supplementation, knowing that progesterone does a whole bunch of other things too. Mm -hmm. Nora is an expert in epilepsy and Nora, like you, you can share, like Mm -hmm. it can help so many things, autoimmune Mm -hmm. epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So if it's being used for other things, then you're not necessarily going to know. So I like to use a compounded progesterone because I can tweak the dose. I can make sure it's the right um, type for the patient. And I know it's clean. The -the over-the-counter ones are are okay, but they're you're limited is in terms of the percentage. It's like three percent or six percent or what have you. You want to be able to sometimes they don't even tell you how many milligrams the patient's actually getting. So I like to make sure that I call the shots on the amount so that I can track and tweak what I need to be doing, right? I think that's an important thing that you're making a statement on. And that's one of the things, you know, we have some in the U.S. that are, are labeled as 20 milligrams per quarter teaspoon of a topical abs- application. But and, and we have some other folks who are making their own proprietary blends, which can be confusing for folks yeah. uh-huh. when, when it yes. comes to trying to figure out, well, how do I do this? I personally, in my practice, I'm like, well, let's let's talk. And then yeah. I, I like the oral micronized oral micronized from the compounding pharmacy. Yes, because I can tweak dosage, but yes. uh, depending on, you know, where someone's at, I think it's important for us to kind of talk about all the different options and that um, birth control progestins. I love that you mentioned that Nora on that, because a lot of people have told me, and I think this is a myth that's going around. Oh, well, I had a depo shot and I went crazy. And so I can't handle progesterone. I'm like, that's not progesterone. Or I didn't do well on birth control. I can't handle progesterone. No, 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 it's not that. And and I think that's a really important component for folks to hear about and know about. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. um, I was um, for um, for, um, Canadian naturopathic medicine awareness week, I would do an annual talk about cycle charting and, you know, I would call it eco-friendly birth control. And I started doing this, gosh, probably 2004, 2005. And a newspaper picked up on it and interviewed me. So Canada's three national newspapers interviewed me, the, the National Post, the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star. And no one wanted to publish what I had to say except for the National Post. So, so I tried to make it very groovy. And I just said, you know, um, you know, let's save the planet, you know, because with the pill, you, you can have all these metabolites get into the water supply. And is it any wonder that maybe women are ovulating less and men's sperm counts are going down? And the Canadian government from the Canadian fishery said, nah, we just need better filtration plants. Nah, there's no, there's no connection. Nah. But um, I was undaunted because um, there was one country I want to shout out to. Denmark has done the best research on the pill. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And, and it's sort of for survival. I think in the 1990s, the Danish government noticed a falling birth rate. Mm-hmm. No, no, sorry. Sorry, I, did, I lied. A falling abortion rate. So this is interesting. So they, they track uh-huh. they track these vile statistics. They're thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Fewer abortions this year. I wonder what's going on. And these, these would be people, at teens and in their 20s, so young people. What's going on? Anyway, and so a good scientist was very curious. And rather than poke and prod at women, he just asked for a bunch of <laughs> seminal fluid analysis samples from 5,000 men, basically. And so these are young men in their 20s, and he knows plunging sperm counts Mm -hmm. in men. Mm -hmm. And so the Danish government has been investigating this since the 90s. And then the Danish government, again, about three years ago, maybe five, came out with a study about, hmm, maybe the pill isn't great for family planning because a lot of women are depressed on the pill. And that's, you know that's not very good for a society to flourish if half mm-hmm. the population is depressed. Mm-hmm. So, so the Danish government has, has a lot of integrity. They're curious. They look at numbers, they record, they observe, and they're definitely non-Puritan about it. And I like that. I like that because you need to look at all these vital numbers and vital statistics. And so I think very few societies are interested in this, in these topics. So, so does the pill affect fertility? I think it does. Um, anyway, and so that's another reason why I like to promote cycle charting is that it's eco-friendly and, you know, and um, increases communications between the partners and it's healthy for, it's healthy for everyone involved. So. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it lends towards just getting to know, like I mentioned before, getting to, to know your body better mm-hmm. and really understanding you. And I think for a lot of females who maybe have now had their children, they're headed into menopause. I think cycle cycle mapping is, and cycle tracking is huge because now we can assess what's changed 
sense kids, but also what's changed as we get older, what's changing as we go into perimenopause. And as I like to tell my patients, you know, the better you go into menopause, the better it's going to be in terms of symptoms of that nature. Yep. So knowing your, your body and knowing what it's up to in, in this state is even great information. Mm-hmm. So both of you work a little bit on the sides of, of fertility in terms of, of working on helping folks get pregnant and in infertility treatments and kind of putting that together. Now, I have a lot of folks who come into my office and they will be doing IUI, so inner uterine inseminations, and they're not, they're only using their apps to track things. Maybe they have, you know, depending on how many different interventions that they have going on at that time, I would be curious to what you would say with someone who's doing IUIs or IVFs or things of that nature in, in terms of what how can cycle mapping help in that case? Because there's going to be some intricacies with trigger shots and things of that nature. And they're put on birth control if we're looking at, yeah. <laughs> so I have a case to, I have a, it's a good point. Like with IUI, you're sort of following their own natural cycle yeah. and that, you know, the trigger might be timed, but the follicle is, is being monitored. Yeah. IVF is a little bit different because a lot of times they're priming them with birth control. So they're kind of controlling the cycle, right? Yeah. So yeah. only so much you can do there, but with IUI, you still kind of want, like, especially in these times now, we've had a lot of patients who have had to do their own sort of monitoring on their own. And then they sort of come in, they say, okay, come in on cycle day 11 and we'll do your trigger. Well, I had a patient, she was tracking her, her mucus and her mucus started w- a few days earlier. And I said, you know what, just call the clinic. And because she called them, they, they actually had her come in two days sooner and had they have not. Right. Um, it would have missed her, her window altogether. So I think it's still relevant. It can tell us how they're responding to the meds. Um, a lot of the um, gonadotropin analogs that say gonal F or puragon, menopure, those things can be very drying to a cycle. Sorry, my dog's crying in the background, <laughs> very drying to a woman's cycle. So repeated IUIs over time, you know, from a, even from a Chinese medicine perspective can be very depleting for a woman's cervical fluid and her lining, right? So these are things that we want to take care of in their rest months. And I, I do often advocate to women, if you've been at this a couple of times, like you need to take a break for a couple of months so we can kind of rebuild and re, rebalance your hormones in between and try to optimize things as much as we can. And, you know, our mission is to restore fertility mm-hmm. so that women can have healthy, singleton, full-term, safe pregnancies yes. where their, you know, their hormone levels are adequate all the way through. Because with those added interventions, there are risks. Mm-hmm. And we know some women sort of, if, you know, if you have blocked tubing, you, you don't really have much choice. But there are women who have this idea of, there's no diagnosis. They've been given this unexplained infertility and just pushed right to IVF. And there's so much missing. There's so much that can be done without them having to go to that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're teaching our doctors across North America, nurse midwives, nurse practitioners Mm -hmm. who have prescribing rights to look at this restorative approach, um, not just with progesterone, but other, you mm-hmm. know, repurposed uses of medications at lower dosages to restore cervical fluid, to restore sperm health, um, because it's a safer approach. Oh, absolutely. 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 Yeah. I love that you mentioned that. I was hoping that was where I was going to go. Because <laughs> get an agenda. <laughs> yes, I have an agenda. Of course, I would like, you know, I have patients who will come to me because I do a lot of acupuncture. I have a, a background of doing acupuncture with fertility mm-hmm. um, from when I first got started in, in the naturopathic medicine and acupuncture game. And for me, it was like, oh, if I could just see these people before they got on all these meds and the trigger shots and the birth control and the, the different cycles, it, it, you know, I'm like, wow, we, we could really get somewhere. But also what you just mentioned about the IUI and not, you know, some people maybe if they were paying attention to their cycle, they might be able to give the clinic a constant, hey, wait, no, I'm I'm good to go right now. I think this is important. I think that's probably why a lot of IUIs fail. Maybe, I mean, maybe a lot of, I, I'm like going, these, wow. These clinics, crazy. these clinics don't, they ignore the woman's white flow. Cervical fluid is not a player in fertility where very much it is a player in fertility. Yeah. You know, because if you if sperm enters a woman's body on a dry day, it's going to get killed by the acidic environment. Um, 
And it only becomes alkaline and full of sugar and nutrients on those white flow days. And that's what keeps sperm alive for up to five days. So, And people forget that that milieu that's not just in the vagina or the cervix, it's all the way through yeah. into your fallopian tube Yeah, yeah, it is bathing that sperm and yeah. feeding it. So even if it's IUI, you're bypassing a little bit of that runway, but right. you still have fluid in the fallopian tube that's either going to be sperm friendly or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's all about, I mean, I love water. I love swimming, but you know, we're, we're conceived in water, you know, when, when the ova ruptures, it's bathed in fluid, you know, and it's, 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 it's nourished. It's being nourished in that fluid. The fallopian, fallopian tube is full of fluid and that's where we're conceived. We're bathed in fluid. And so um, it is an unsung hero in the fertility world. Yeah. And so we're, we're trying to get the word out about white flow. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's call to, yep. It's our mission. Call to action. Call to action. <laughs> I want to see those t-shirts. I, I want to see these t-shirts. <laughs> t-shirts so speaking of that, yeah. if folks are listening to this and, and they're naturopaths, they're, they're docs, they're like, Hey, you know, or even just the, the regular public, I think, I think even taking your course could be useful for folks that might even want to just understand their body a little bit better. I do. I do. I think that the cycle cycle tracking and, and just really getting a good sense of of what is going on with it, with this charting and how how the body responds. I think. Well, you, you know, you know what, for your listeners, I'd like to recommend they get in touch with a fertility awareness um, practitioner. Yeah. And there are many there's so many wonderful professionals out there. So there's um, the Justice Method. And it was founded by a midwife in, in BC called Geraldine Matus. And they, um, they have practitioners all over North America. Okay. There's also the Fertility Care Centers of America, mm-hmm. and they have practitioners all over North America, and they teach cycle charting. You also, So those are, those are two that I highly, highly recommend. I'm trained in the fertility care um, system, and it was developed at Creighton University, and I love the training. And I, it just for me, it was just so eye-opening. And it really taught me that subtle lecture that Dr. Jessica had alluded to earlier. So, you know, when you're um, in the culture, when you're, um, when you're young and fertile, you know, having sex on a day of fertility, <gasps> it's dangerous. It's a dangerous day because it's Russian roulette. You don't want to get pregnant, you know? <laughs> so, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Fertility is seen as dangerous and undesirable. And, um, And then, you know, when you're struggling with fertility, those days are so valuable. Those are the right days. Those are the best days. And when you step back and look at the importance of every day in the cycle. So you look back because you you want those days of infertility because it's prepping the body. The body is resting pre-peak. And then, then the follicle will start to grow. Or those dry days after ovulation, the body has, you know, rising progesterone. So those dry days are your friend. Mm -hmm. And every day is a day of value in the woman's cycle. And that was a very subtle message that this is a photograph of a woman. She has, she has days of fertility and days of infertility. Let's really um, learn about them and really, really honor them because Mm -hmm. human beings aren't cats and dogs and bears. We don't just have sex to make babies. We have sex for all kinds of reasons, for intimacy, for communication, for validation, for bonding and making babies. So sex for humans is not just about those great fertile days or those dangerous fertile days, whatever you want to call them. But there, we, there's all kinds of reasons why there's, I mean, the, the sexual dimensions, the human dimensions of sexuality are layered. And that's what cycle charting taught me. And, and so I could impart that with my, my patients in the past. Mm-hmm. So, And it's good for men too, right? So that they're not feeling under the pressure on those days of fertility, if charting becomes a shared experience. So I often say to my female patients, you observe, you're the one wiping all day and you bring out that spreadsheet and you get your partner to chart it for you on the spreadsheet. So it's joint. He's invested as much as she is. And so for him, those days of infertility are great for him, right? Like pressure's off, they could have spice, they could have fun. And there's no pressure. And then that helps both of them, that bonding, that oxytocin for women reduces stress hormones. That's, that's good for fertility. And another thing I want to talk about. So (laughs) another thing I love, you know, there's this common assumption that women's libido is highest when, when she's fertile, Well, this is untrue. Mm -hmm. Now you'd think there'd be more research done on women's libido. So there was some research done in the 1950s. I think it's (laughs) hilarious. 
Mm-hmm. I know. So, so couples were actually married women were, were given questionnaires, you know, when is your libido? Well, good news guys, any time of the month. So mm-hmm. I'm going to walk through. Okay. So it's, and for me, it's a, it's a biomarker. It's a healthy, it's a fifth vital sign during your period. Some women have very high libido because for some women rising um, progesterone in the previous cycle can make them feel a bit anxious. That's in some women. So whoosh, when the period starts, some women feel so so much relief, libido is up there. Mm-hmm. So woohoo. And then some women have a lot of libido when they're fertile because the, the follicles growing and rising estrogen can help some women with a lot of confidence and feeling more extroverted and their libido will go up during days of fertility. And then post-peak days of during days of infertility, some women have rising testosterone right before the menses. So that's going to give them a lot of libido. So the conclusion is you don't have to be fertile to have high libido. And so it really, again, it points to my, you know, uh, comment earlier that sex is not just about making babies. It's about mm-hmm. all kinds of reasons. So, mm-hmm. so fifth vital sign libido every day. So <laughs> that's our take home message for today. There you Public go. service announcement. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So ladies, tell us a little bit about where we can find you online because I found the continuing education course. I know that I found Nora on on Instagram at nora.pope. Now, now Jessica, where do we find you? Kind of give us the details. <laughs> I'm so- a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at uh, the fertility ND on Instagram and Facebook. And um, I own a clinic in Toronto called Lakeside Natural Health Center. So we um, naturopaths in Ontario can only treat people in Ontario. So that's not going to help some of the, maybe some of your listeners, but for those practitioners out there who want to find us and look at taking our very comprehensive course, um, it's open to naturopathic doctors, physicians, nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacists, anybody who's working with fertility, you're going to get a lot of good juicy clinical tidbits from it. And that's at um, fertilityce.com. And our Instagram is fertility.ce. So that's where you can hang out with us. And we sometimes do um, Instagram lives and we're going to be relaunching our course. And it's, it's a six hour juicy course, but it's broken up into three modules and you can have unlimited access for it until next February. So and then, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And then the six hour, the first two hours is a deep dive into cycle charting, the ins and outs, how it works. So you can learn about how to read a chart. So you get to learn, get the know-how in part one. Part two is start timing how do you time those ultrasounds? How do you ta- time those meds? And we talk talk about a dozen different meds that are, you know, the old term is off label, the new term is repurposed, and uh, absolutely safe, they're safe. They're yeah. just safe, minimum dose. So one tenth or one twentieth of the dose of what you would use them in a previous, you know, life. And it's meant to restore hormone levels in both men and women. So we mm-hmm. talk about those protocols, timed and sync with the cycle. And then part three, we bring it all together with naturopathic modalities to include acupuncture, botanical medicine, and, and nutraceuticals, again, timed in cooperation with the cycle. And that's sort of a brief summary of the course. So, and we get and we got credits for obstetrics and prescribing authority pharmacy credits for in some jurisdictions. So Lovely. Lovely. That's excellent. I think that is great stuff for all of us out there. And especially for us that can take advantage of the course in particular, the rest of you guys, we need to go out and have you finding specialists in your area. So we had talked about the fertility care centers of America folks. And then I wanted to recap on the Matisse person from BC. Can you re give me that so I can get it in the notes here for folks? So it's called justice, like justice, but in French. So J U S T I S S E, okay. And okay. and the woman's called Geraldine Matus, M A T U S. Okay. And okay. Uh, forgive me, I, I can't remember the name of the organization. So yeah, you can look up justice, and there's justice practitioners mm-hmm. all over the world. Yeah. Okay. And also, yeah, I want to shout out to Lisa Hendrickson Jacks. She's done an amazing job. She she she's a she's a practitioner and she teaches people all over the world. Lisa Hendrickson Jack, her company's called Fertility Friday and she teaches cycle charting. So she's okay, great. Okay, Fertility Friday. Okay. <laughs> Got it. I so folks who are listening to this now, um got it. Okay. 
I have all of this in my chart notes here, my chart notes. Gee, I'm like in the office at this point. And my <laughs> my podcast notes at drjcrossnd.com. And so if you guys are looking for any of the stuff that was mentioned here on this podcast, you can find it all over there or you can DM me and I will let you know where to get you the good stuff. And I do know that I do have a lot of listeners in Toronto and Calgary and BC. So we do have Canada covered. And so my Toronto awesome. folks, now you know who to see and, and <laughs> head over to if you are struggling or if you know someone who is, please, please get yourself into Dr. Jessica and, and get things figured out. Oh, yeah. Don't wait too yeah. Long. And then we, so we've trained naturopathic doctors all over North America. Um, if, the, if anyone wants the name of an ND who's taken our course, we'd be happy to give yeah, that to you we as can well. Share our network because yeah. they're, they're superstars. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. There you awesome. go. Thank you so much for having us so much fun. You're awesome. Oh, well, thank you. This is great. I love sharing information. I think we'll probably have to do another one on with the two of you and where we go into some other details in terms of the repurposed meds a little bit. Because I yes. Think yes. That stuff <laughs> All right. Hey, health junkies. I hope you enjoyed my podcast. If you want to continue the conversation based on what topic I'm talking about at any given time on the Health Fix podcast, head over to my Facebook group, Find Your Health Fix. It's where we are talking about what's going on in health, what I'm talking about in the podcast, and I love to answer questions there. So come hang out and join the conversation. And by the way, right now I have a free Manage Your Stress Naturally course that you can grab on my website at drjkrausnd.com because so many people are stressed out right now and really it has to do with the basics, your routines and simple habits that are messing you up. So head on over to drjkrausnd.com and go check out my free course on managing stress naturally. All right, folks, have a great day, whatever you're doing. Subscribe, rate, and share info. 